Hello and welcome to the Almost 30 Podcast. It's Lindsay and Krista. What's happening? What's happening? We're so glad to have you. We know there's a lot of options and we're grateful you chose Almost 30, especially those who have been with us for years, baby. I've been getting so many OG DMs. Yes. Very sweet. I love our community because there's so many that will message me and be like, hey, I've been listening for five years. And I just wanted to tell you this thing. Mm-hmm. Like, there's such a processed, <laughs> like, confident, strong, independent, like, respectful group. Totally. Yeah, I love the questions that we get. Usually, more often than not, I'll voice note back because I. Same. it's so hard to kind of. Same. I can put it into words, but it's just nice to, like, rip and. Yes. Um. So now I'm going to probably have people expecting voice notes. 100%. But it is actually something on that. I like it. It's interesting. I was talking to a friend um, and this was an interesting perspective that I've never thought about. But she was saying, she's like, I don't respond to DMs because it could be a liability. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, so if you think about it in times, there's people that really need help or are in dire need. I don't get that quite often. I don't get that often. I I don't get that really much anymore, but she's like, I don't respond because of the potential of a liability. Mm -hmm. You know, having you be the last person they talk to or having you be someone that they're referencing or something like that is interesting. Sure. And so it's just interesting perspective because I think a lot of times, you know, for someone before I had an audience or people that were listening or I engaged with, I would have been like, oh, why can't they answer everybody? Or why can't they, you know, help people? Because you assume Mm -hmm. it's just help, which it is. But then there is the other side of it for someone that's a creator or influencer where you actually have to be mindful about the repercussions of your actions and the fact of you don't know who's on the receiving end or who's on the end of inquiry to you for help. Yeah, absolutely. Whether it's like advice or just needing support. Yeah. Yeah. I I think about that with like advice related to whether it's like skin health or whatever, yeah, like, of course, we're not experts, yes. <laughs> by the way, not a yes. dermatologist. Um, but yeah, I had so, so much with <laughs> microdosing, the microdosing episode where I talked about my experience. Mm. And after I put out that episode, I was like, this is illegal. Yeah. <laughs> I literally, it literally, some people like I had, I had so much of a response. And then I was looking at it. And I'm like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, I just shared about that and it's illegal. I I honestly was like, but it's not illegal everywhere. I don't even know. That's like, (laughs) but that's what's so crazy. I'm like, what's, I I, I still can't believe it. That's how much I just do my thing. So you're a criminal. I'm a criminal. (laughs) I'm an absolute criminal. 100%. I'm like, could someone even use that against me? I don't even know. But that's how much I'm kind of just in my world. Yeah. Doing my thing. And also sometimes it's you forget people are listening. Exactly. So many people are listening. Exactly. Um, but yeah, it was hilarious. I also think it's helped a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. It's been powerful to see our audience, the people that have resonated or yeah. chosen to to do move forward with whatever path they want. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been really, really beautiful. Yeah. And there's a lot of work out it from like Michael Pollan. Uh, mm-hmm. Paul Stamets and people that have gone on Tim Ferriss. Tim Ferriss is like yep. very much leading the charge. Yep. Maps is incredibly powerful. If mm-hmm. people want more research, I want to have someone on to go into like the deep science of it um, soon. So we will be talking more about that. Yeah. I'm always like uh, on the lookout for how mainstream it's going to get. Yeah. Because oftentimes when it hits the mainstream, there's usually you just kind of have to have your radar on of like, hmm. Is this like pure, potent? Is this real? Is this true? Are they, you know, I don't know. I just get a little skeptical when I see like on Netflix, they're doing something, which I appreciate because I think it's great to have this be more accessible and more accepted. And I think a lot of people behind it see dollar signs, Mm -hmm. you know? So it's like, I just hope it retains the, you know, Purity. Yeah, mm-hmm. of what it really is. Mm-hmm. Especially because it's a plant. Uh huh. I think that's when I really think about it, you know, or it's not a plant, it's a fungus. Mm-hmm. But that's what, even with, you know, ayahuasca or any of those other types of medicines, you're like, at the core, this is a plant and yeah. it's part of the earth. So you want to always have respect for it. Yes. Um, But today, I'm really excited about this one. I was messaging with Lindsay and our podcast producer after this interview that I did in New York with Rupi, and it was incredible. She is so present and so tender and so um, authentic. You know, Mm -hmm. I was so grateful that 
I got to speak with her and have her have the conversation when she was having a moment. She was having a few days of tears. She was having a few days of emotion. She was having a few days of raw truth. And I think when you see her work, you're like, oh, that feels feels on point, mm-hmm. you know, for someone to be a deep feeler and be someone yeah. that's deeply emotional. And for me, it feels so liberating to connect with people like that, that are creatives, that are artists, that are really in touch with their expression of emotions and their experience of emotions. Yeah. So you are all going to love this, especially if you come from your community. I think you're going to see and experience a really beautiful um, human side of her that I'm not sure I've heard before. Yeah. And I just appreciate like, you know, you meeting her at a moment where she's having, you know, a said moment, but it's like, I think anyone in the public eye can so easily yeah. be like, okay, I gotta be on, yes. I gotta clean it up. You know, I really appreciate the realness and I appreciate that in anyone, whether it's on camera, off on a podcast or not, like just being where you are mm-hmm. and like really owning it. And I feel like that's the ability to kind of move through it rather than move around it and then have it come back and bite you in the butt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Matters of the heart. You know, it's completely matters of the heart. She is a best-selling author. She has um, a new book out called Healing Through Words, which is really incredible. She's on tour now. She has a world tour, which you can go to her website to get tickets for at rupikaur.com. It's R-U-P-I-K-A-U-R.com. And she is a poet, artist, and performer. So she wrote Milk and Honey, which has been sold 10 million times in 42 language. She wrote Sun and Her Flowers. She produced a debut album, Rupi Kaur Live, which is on Amazon Prime Video now. And she's been on bestseller lists forever. So she is someone that speaks on love, loss, trauma, healing, femininity, and migration. And she really is someone that's just a beautiful artist. Her Instagram is incredible. It's R-U-P-I-K-A-U-R underscore. And she has a bunch of beautiful poems and works of art. And her outfits are works of art. I know. Um, She's incredibly inspiring. There was a few really beautiful passages I wanted to just bring up before we get into the conversation. There was something I read that I really, really loved and I felt like was so beautiful and just so true, so simple. On days you can't hear yourself, slow down to let your mind and body catch up with each other, Mm. which is such a powerful moment because maybe we're not lost. Maybe we're just moving too fast. Yes. Such a beautiful integration. Mm. I really love her other poem from Homebody. She says, give me laugh lines and wrinkles. I want proof of the jokes we shared. Engrave the lines into my face like the roots of a tree that grow deeper with each passing year. I want sunspots as souvenirs for the beaches we laid on. I want to look like I was never afraid to let the world take me by the hand and show me what it's made of. I want to leave this place knowing I did something with my body other than trying to make it look perfect. Love. Such a good Mm. one. She says this poem in Homebody inspired a longer spoken word poem I performed on tour called Laugh Lines. She wrote it for the days when we feel like giving up or feel like we shouldn't bother. Mm. So you can see her on tour and she'll be doing a lot of her readings. They seem really powerful. And she has her new book out, which is going to be really exciting. In the new book, it actually walks people through the process of how to write Mm. and how she writes. So in Healing Through Words, she really has writing as a form of self-care. So it's really designed to help you feel more, to connect with yourselves. And it has all the writing secrets that she uses within her process. Yes. Yeah, I've realized that writing is like such a it's like this sacred conversation with yourself, you know, and if people read it and they're touched by it, beautiful. But like, like even reading her work, especially, I feel like this is, it's like that, those love letters to herself and reminders to herself and, um, yeah, to incorporate it as a practice. I, I feel like I'm someone that resists it sometimes because of like that tendency to be needed to be perfect yes. or edited or whatever has been really profound when I've kind of pushed through that resistance. Mm, I love it. Yeah, I can't wait to start writing more. I'm not mm-hmm. enjoying it right now, but it'll, like, it'll can't help. wait till I start. <laughs> <laughs> can't wait. Because it's like I'm trying to, like, make it a thing. It's trying, yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean? I'm like, what kind of graphic will this live in on Instagram? Or, like, what? Mm-hmm. How, how's this going to be in a book? It's like, just mm-hmm. write. It's like shit. writing. It's like making a practice of just writing for you yes. for a while yes. so that almost the other stuff dissolves. Mm-hmm. And then eventually you can take that body. I can hear myself saying in an interview, 
this is the work I was just writing for me. Where <laughs> 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 it's just like, it's like I already just go 50 steps to like how that's yeah, part I'm of like, my story. Down, yeah, everyone. literally. <laughs> just write for you, for you. Um, thank you so much, Ruby, for coming on Almost 30. It means the world. We are so grateful. If you are from our community, welcome. We talk about spirituality and wellness. We try to be as authentic and real as possible and present with you as possible. We have an amazing community. We have courses and programs on our website, almost30.com. Almost 30 podcast on TikTok, which is so fun. We have quotes. We have a bunch of beautiful quotes from this interview living on TikTok. And then Almost 30 podcast on Instagram. Yeah. And I'm at Lindsay Simsick. And I'm at It's Krista. Thanks for listening, y'all. We will see you on the next one. See you soon. If you're not a part of our Almost 30 book club, consider this your sign to join today. Yes, we are so excited to be partnering with Chirp, which is an audiobook retailer known for their great deals without any commitments or subscriptions. I was hesitant about using an audiobook platform because I felt like there was such a hassle with subscriptions. They were actually more expensive than a lot of books. So I was really excited to find Chirp because it's a non-subscription-based, really affordable way that you can dig into a lot of books and content easily. So each month, what we're going to do is we're going to pick one of our favorite books and they'll deeply discount it for the almost 30 listeners. You ask Lindsay and I what we read all of the time. So by being in our book club, this is the best way to know. And if you've been following along, you know that we announce the pick of the month at the top of each month. Uh, so you got to listen to our pod, <laughs> listen along together to each book. And at the end of the month, you'll have a chance to share your thoughts and see what other club members thought too. Are you ready? Okay. October. We're excited to read Getting the Love You Want by Harville Hendricks and Helen LaKelly Hunt. I love this one so much. This is a staple. This is like the Bible. Mm -hmm. The Bible on the bedside. Relationship 101, <laughs> yeah. baby. It's unbelievable. <laughs> in every, it's interesting. So in every therapy that I've really done, a lot of the principles and practices have been taken from this book. And I consider these two like pioneers in this relationship work. Um, Sean and I actually read this together early on when we were doing long distance, but it's been really nice to go back and listen to it. There's something about listening to it that I just love. So if you want to join book club, go to chirpbooks.com slash almost 30 and pick up getting the love you want on sale for $1.99 for a limited time. You heard her right. Originally priced at $26.99, you can start listening to Getting the Love You Want today by joining our book club for $1.99. So again, go to chirpbooks.com slash almost 30 and pick up Getting the Love You Want. And I really, really think you guys are going to love this one. And be sure to press follow at chirpbooks.com slash almost 30 to join our club and to stay in the loop on future picks and other exclusive content from us. This is so exciting. If you haven't heard us just gushing about Shrimu, not cheese, y'all take a seat. Okay. I'm so excited because this is a plant-based artisanal, not cheese collection that you will be absolutely blown away by. It is pure and delicious and I got to say, I know it's going to sound a little out there, but it's absolutely true. The frequency of this food is so high. And I can tell this because after I eat it, I feel amazing. I eat it slowly. Um, and I can just tell the thought intention that was put into crafting each one of these cheeses. Shrimu is as I said, a plant-based artisanal, not cheese collection, and it's devotional offerings for life. The founder, Julie Pyatt, I mean, everything she does is with the utmost intentions. And the people who make the cheeses are called sacred makers, and they don't touch the product unless they've done a breathing meditation. So that's what you're feeling when you're eating it. It was truly crafted with lots of love and peace and presence. Uh, Shreemu is a global mission of awakening. It is a frequency of a mother's love, full of unconditional love, acceptance, and celebration for all the unique life forms that make up a human family. It's paleo, plant-rich, gluten-free, dairy-free, raw, and uh, honestly, I think anyone who loves cheese is going to love this. So um, I wanted to mention 
oh my God, a recipe that I made recently. I found it on their blog at shrimu.com. So it's the cloud nine caprese salad. Oh, you guys. Okay. So you whip together some pasta, diced tomatoes, and you use the shrimu cloud nine clouds. Um, so it's kind of like a mozzarella, like it's just creamy. It's even better to be honest. That's why I'm hesitating because I'm like, actually it's better. Um, I put some basil in there, a balsamic glaze, olive oil, salt, pepper. Oh, so freaking good. I'm mentioning some of my flavors that I love. So I love the elder. So this is a classic brie. Elder is it's super mild, creamy. I also love the gold alchemy. Uh, this is super smoky. It's a smoked gouda and it is turmeric, has properties of turmeric and black pepper. It's made from organic cashews, organic coconut oil, organic Irish moss, organic turmeric, liquid smoke. Y'all, it is so, so, so beautiful. Also, I love the Dolce Vita and Imagine. Uh, They're creamy lemon infused wheels. So you can bring them to parties. It's just so yummy. I'm going to stop talking because it's going to speak for itself when you order. And I'm really excited because almost 30 listeners get 20% off all single orders and 20% off the first four orders when they sign up for a subscription. What? When you use the code ALMOST30, go to shrimu.com. That's S-R-I-M-U.com. You're going to use the code ALMOST30 for 20% off all single orders and 20% off the first four orders when they sign up for a subscription. By they, I mean you when you sign up for that subscription. So I think that option is uh, what I'm going to do moving forward. So enjoy. Again, shrimu.com, code ALMOST30. Everyone asks, what's your skincare routine? And I have to say, Clear Stem is my freaking favorite. All the way. Clean clean beauty works. It truly works. I really love... So we've had Kaylee and Dana, Danielle on the podcast. Danielle is the acne guru. And I love that this line is anti-acne and also anti-aging. So I had a lot of trouble with my like acne products because they were so drying. Mm -hmm. They were so, they stripped my skin so much and my skin has never felt and looked better. Um, Sean uses it. He Mm -hmm. uses the vitamin scrub, which has been really great for his ingrown hairs. I just absolutely love that everything is backed by science. Everything is thoughtfully made and they make sure not to put uh, poor clogging ingredients in the products. Yeah. Or hormone disruptors, which mm-hmm. are really important. There's no toxins. It's silicone free. I really love the Hydroglow stem cell moisturizer. So stem cells are the key. It gives your skin this like buoyant voluptuousness. It's my favorite. I felt like my skin looks amazing. And then the bounce back serum, I the best. can't even the best. explain I'm to you. I'm out of it and I'm actually freaking Same. out. I just ordered some this <laughs> yeah, morning. Yeah, I have to order it. <laughs> so I love that they're really thoughtful and mindful about their products. They actually really work. I feel good using them. The stem cells are really, really the key. Um, and if you want more information about their brand and journey and just the education behind it, I highly suggest listening to the podcast, but you have to try their products. Yeah. So their products are incredible for, as we said, acne, anti-aging, but also melasmas scar damage, hyperpigmentation. Um, It's also pregnancy safe. So go to clearstemskincare.com. That's clearstemskincare.com and use the code almost 30 at checkout for 15% off your purchase. I'm excited for you guys to try. Let us know what you're loving. Again, clearstemskincare.com. Use the code almost 30 for 15% off. So I'm probably just going to cry this whole fucking interview because that's where I am right now. Okay, okay? great. (laughs) I'm okay. And like, that's probably why I'm going to cry. Like, I Mm -hmm. think I'm just like, one thing I've been saying recently is anytime I felt hurt or broken or confused, it was like, those were um, such bad things to feel. Cause that's what, Mm -hmm. you know, like the society that we live in, especially in the West tells us. And I would always just like, pull up my boots and be like, okay, what are the 10 things I need to do right now to fix all of these things and, you know, and numb myself. And then I wouldn't cry. I would just get through it. And now I'm just like, I feel confused and lost or when I feel broken and I feel completely whole in that feeling. And I'm just like, well, you did that interview with Aubrey and um, that idea, uh, that idea of just like, 
letting it wash over you and seeing people's pain Mm -hmm. and just feeling it. I'm like there right now. So I've just been crying for like the last two weeks. Anyone tells me their story or anything and I'm just Mm -hmm. allowing it. (laughs) Well, I'm so grateful you said that and opened up with that because I, even before I got here was at Whole Foods and there was this man with a dog And the way that he, this is how insane I am. The way he was holding the dog chain felt too tight for me. And the dog Mm. looked scared. And I was like, God, how do I live life when I am thinking about this dog for the rest of my afternoon that I'm Mm. perceiving to be held too tightly on the chain? It's like in, in the Aubrey interview, you probably heard it's such, and I'm excited that we're going this direction. It is such a beautiful blessing to feel and to be a feeler. Mm. It is Mm -hmm. such a gift on this earth, but it is so exhausting at times and I actually Mm -hmm. still am working with that energy of how can I see this as a blessing when sometimes it feels like a burden it feels like it's like okay when is the other side when is the beauty so how do you is this new for you to just be feeling and really being experiencing all the tears instead of moving to solver or are you someone that's seasoned in the ability to feel I think I'm I am seasoned in that like I have been this way since I was a child and I think that kind of stopped when I sort of my first book became so big and then all the noise of being like pushed into the public sort of like came in I think that made me very numb which we can talk about later but um, my dad had this like running joke about how I'm so when I was younger because he would say that oh she she's she could cry at the snap of your fingers And I could, it was like, and he didn't understand that because he's not a crier in my house was a, you weren't allowed to cry in our home. And that was very difficult because I am so empathetic. And I I, I would, I would see somebody on the street who looked sad to me and I would just, I couldn't. And I just five years old and I'd just be bawling, you know? Um, And I think that Uh, that's why I write like I have to put it somewhere and I've always felt like I use this metaphor of like feeling like a sink that's overflowing Mm -hmm. and it is like if I don't put it somewhere then it's just gonna like rot me from the inside and so poetry and writing really became the sort of like vessel where I could like safely store it somewhere and then share it and then that for some reason when I would share it it would make me feel connected to other people because then other people would be like, yes, I feel that too. Or I've had this experience and then we could talk about it together and feel less alone. And so I think that really became the sort of like full circle moment for me. But, um, I totally understand. I mean, it's so hard to figure out. Okay. You can feel it. And then where do you put it? And I, I don't know the answer there's no right answer but for me the answer is art yeah you're like healing through writing and then you like lift (laughs) your book up you're like I have a solution for all of you oh my god that's so true hold on it is honey yeah you're like (laughs) should I go get everybody (laughs) yes get it and then you're like thanks everyone for joining this was amazing (laughs) this wasn't an ad but that does fit perfectly into this oh my god funny (laughs) <laughs> and so I guess what has been, you know, if you're, if you're open to sharing, mm-hmm. because it is, I'm, if you, I think you as a feeler and someone that shares so much from your heart, I'm someone that if I have something on my heart or my mind, it's really hard for me to sort of be um, in conversation if it, if I don't kind of bring that in. Is there, for the past two weeks, you've been crying. Are you willing to share, you know, what's sort of been on your heart that's felt really um, emotional for you? I feel like I am in between this crossroads um I've spent like I've performed for the last 13 years and much of this last deck well mostly all throughout my 20s I've been in the sort of like public space public eye and I'm turning 30 in a month and oh my god it's coming um Um. and I I guess I'm just like processing I mean I don't know it just I feel like it goes by like this and I've just been on this like train that I didn't know I was getting on um, because that book I wrote 
for me. It wasn't even a book. It was poems that I wrote for myself that made me feel so close to home in my body. And then it was like one thing led to another, led to another, and it all kind of got very out of hand. And then it all just was everybody else's. And then oh, everybody. Suddenly this book is in millions of hands and then it's like now I have to write the next one and then the mm-hmm. pressure and then the I have felt like a like machine just the pressure to stay relevant push things out the pressure of like I have a team I need to keep creating because I have to make sure that I I am feeding people you know I am that person for my family and I'm very fortunate to be that person I feel blessed to be that person um you know when when my success came, it was a time when we were not financially well. Um, and so this really was a blessing. But now I'm really at a crossroads with like how I want to live the next 10 years, because it's definitely not the way I've been living it for the last mm-hmm. 10 years. And so that's kind of where the emotions kind of come from. And I've been talking to so many artists and writers and so many new people I've met. Um, I've been traveling for a little bit for over the last like two weeks and hearing their stories and hearing them sort of share the same things I'm talking about, I think has made me even more emotional, um, made me feel less alone. Yeah. Isn't it so interesting how that works where you have this beautiful soul experience where your soul is like, this is what's right for me. This is what I need. I'm going to share this art or I'm going to create this art. And then the ego comes in and it's like, let's do that again. Like, let's make that our identity. Let's share that with the world. Let's make that our art. You know, it's like, and then you're chasing it. You're just like, okay, now I'm this person. I do this thing. And you're like, wait, I want the soul part again. Like, where do I get that that part within this? And it's such an interesting thing to hear you say this because most people probably perceive she has everything. She's done everything. She has living the dream. Do you feel like you'll ever be satisfied in your quest? You know, do you feel like as an artist, there is the opportunity to feel satisfied? Or do you feel like it's part of being an artist to sort of always have that drive to continue to create? As an artist, I'll always have that drive to continue to create. I Mm -hmm. think where it gets complicated is marrying the art and the business because I've been painting and drawing and creating with my hands whether it was sewing dresses or you know like anything with my hands I've been doing that since I was four years old and I always felt fulfilled within it 100 percent even before milk and honey I was like I always felt full and then I think it's when you the business comes in And then trying to balance the two, I think that can become a very tricky and complicated area because capitalism is not designed for us to feel whole. It's not designed for us to feel complete or satisfied because then it wouldn't work. You know, if we're not filled with self-doubt, if we're not insecure, then how would we keep feeding the system of capitalism, which continues to extract from us? And so I don't think that if I'm chasing money or if I'm chasing followers or I'm chasing numbers or any of those things, I'll never feel, I'm never going to feel it. Cause if I'm never going to feel full, because if I was, I would have felt it a long time ago. And the Mm -hmm. truth is in the moments that I think the world probably, or my readers saw me and thought, Oh, she has everything in the, on the inside, I felt probably the most broken. And so I have to, I haven't been on this path. I haven't had integrity with myself. Mm. Um, I haven't been on that path of integrity with myself. And I haven't been on that for quite a few years. And I think for me right now, I don't think I would ever want the drive to create to ever go away. Um, It's what feeds me. It's what makes me like come to life. Um, But in order to do that, I have to step away from the noise. Uh, and so the noise is chasing the numbers. The noise is trying to write another New York Times bestseller. That is Mm -hmm. noise. And I think that especially as women in our twenties, it feels like this is our time to shine. We have this decade to do all of it, be the most 
smart and beautiful and accomplished. Da, 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 da. And then after that, it's like, okay, bye. Nobody wants to see you again. And I've spent like the last decade feeling like, okay, I have to like, um, I have to, I have to create, create, create. But I think the pressure really made me feel like I'll never write another word again. And so writing that second book was horrible. Like I just was like a physical thick mess. And, um, and even before I finished my third book, I was like, I'll never, no, no, no. Like everything I've written, everything I'm going to write from now on will never be as good as what I've already created. It just will not be. And I think it's taken me a long time to get here. And I don't even know if I fully believe it yet, but at least it feels good to say it. And it's that, no, actually, I need the noise to go away because I am the magic. And actually, the noise is, what, is what's distracting me from the magic. And my best work and art is yet to come. But for that to happen, I have to align. I have to be able to hear myself. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure, you know, in just meeting you, it's like it, it even it's like I already feel like a connection and I'm like, okay, but you've also been on tour. You're performing. You're probably also very tired. You're in book launch mode. You're doing all of the things. It's like I often, and I'm curious how you feel about this. Sometimes when I'm feeling so much, I'm kind of going to the places of existential, like my life and this journey. And that's my, my dream is to internalize and intellectualize everything into that. And then also I'm like, ooh, there's like tender spots of me that needs sleep. And there's a tender spot that needs to rest and needs to be alone and needs to be just with my own thoughts and be in my dream state. So how do you balance, you know, your own self-care? And this is, I don't want it to be like a surface level question, but how do you balance the care of yourself when you are feeling so much? Um, I honestly... Before COVID, I wasn't balancing it at all. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then I think it was, I I think it was around, and I mean, I grew up with immigrant parents. Like there's no concept of self-care within my working class family. That's hilarious. Like they would Mm -hmm. be like, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? Like, Mm -hmm. and so I kind of just replicated what they do, which is work all the time, seven days a week. And, uh, I think throughout COVID, because the world paused, it allowed me some stillness for a couple of months. And um, that was so necessary and so life-saving. But I'm going to be honest, like, I knew that getting going on this tour was going to be tough mentally and physically. I knew it, (laughs) but it was a hell of a lot worse once I actually started the damn thing. And... I've only done two months and I think I have like four to eight months left and I'm scared. I'm so scared because I didn't do any self, like it just was like, there was no time because like I, I have to, for self care to happen, I need hours. But when there were none, it just was like, okay, forget it. Like the only self care I did on the road was like eat as well as I could. And, um, exercise when I could and felt the energy felt like I had the energy to do it and um I think that's kind of also made a part of why there's so many emotions running through me I'm, I go on tour next week and I know I'm gonna make it to the end of December but I am scared of like the condition I will be in when I get there because it's gonna be intense and a lot and I'm gonna do it because this is what I set out to do um and I'm not gonna like go back on that but you know it has made me wonder if I ever want to do a world tour again and I probably to be honest don't like I don't the the best part is when I'm up there for 90 minutes it's beautiful it's transcendent and I love it But I just don't know if I can pay the price in my physical and mental health anymore. Yeah, I think people, it's hard to understand the energetics of being on tour. We were on tour for a few years and and you've been on tour on a grander scale. But it's like you're meeting so many people, you're connecting with so many people, you're channeling this energy that is you, 
you're getting ready. You ha- it's just, it is so exhausting and beautiful at the same time. And it can be scary to feel like you have to live up to this expectation every single time. You want people to love you and to see you as the person that they connected with in the work. You want to just give them an amazing show and performance. It's a lot. Um, mm-hmm. But something, in addition to tour, something you talked about before with, you know, your 30th birthday arise, arriving and wanting to just do it differently for the next years. Do you feel like there's like almost a grief coming up where you're sort of seeing your future and it's not involving a lot of the way you've been interacting? So it might not involve a world tour. It might not involve some of the things you've been doing. And is it a feeling of grief that you're kind of going through? Definitely. That is the exact word I've used. I think I'm, I don't know yet if I am grieving that future, but I know I'm definitely grieving the past. and. I'm, I'm, but when I think about the future and when I think about sort of stepping back, that, that makes me smile. So I'm not necessarily Mm -hmm. grieving the future. I think in fact, it feels like an exhale. Mm -hmm. It's scary. It's scary because it's like, what's going to happen? Are people going to forget about you? You know, like the ego comes in and it's like, but that doesn't, I don't think it serves a bigger mission, but definitely there is grief. I remember, and I think this happens every couple of years. I remember when I first sort of felt like pushed into the public, I was for a long time, I grieved my private self, like Mm -hmm. the woman that did so much to like produce this work that connected with millions of people around the world. I grieved her for a long time. And now I think I'm really grieving this woman who has like led me to this moment and being turning 30 is very, like, I feel very, I feel good about it. I mean, it's such a, I've never really had a connection to any number. Like I feel like how I felt Mm -hmm. when I was 23 or 21, it's no big deal, but it's been interesting to like tell people that I'm turning 30 and then watch their reactions. And it's their reactions that make me nervous about it. (laughs) What do they say? What is it like? They'll be like, oh, it's, you're going to be fine. Or like, oh my God. will get like really high pitched. And oh I'm my like, God. oh my God. Like everyone. Dude, babe, life gets better. I'm so, it's so fucking wild because in your 20s, you're like, these are the golden years. These are the best years of your life. You look the best. Everything's amazing. Yo, it is so fucking crazy. When you get over 30, you just like care. It's everyone says it, but you care so much less you chase so much less you like I you just don't find yourself thinking and caring about the same stuff that you cared about and there's such a like fucking power that you have when you're like you know what I've done a lot I feel really good I don't want to be that I don't want to look like that I don't want to have that and it's just like this beautiful settling that I'm like whoa does life keep getting better and better because Mm. I always remember coming from a small town, they'd be like, college are the best years of your life. And I went to college. I'm like, um, if this are the best years of my life, I should just kind of retire now because this is not what I thought. And then life just continued and I became more of myself. I became more embodied. I just did more of the work. I felt more of the feelings and it just gets better. So for you, you're going to be, I mean, this isn't like a pep talk, but you're going to fucking, you're going to Love it. You're going to literally love it. You're going to become more of yourself. You're going to be more successful. You're going to care fucking less. You're going to push less. And you're just going to like embrace it. You're going to be the most beautiful person that's aging. And you're going to create such beautiful work. Oh, oh my gosh. That means. Are you a Virgo? No, I'm a Libra. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Libra, honey. Okay. So that's why we got the we got the birthday soon. Well, what was, um, and you said you're like for the past 10 years, I want to, I've been doing things and I don't want to carry them in. So if we were to say today, if you were to say today, the things that you want to leave behind when you're moving into your thirties chapter, what would you say those things are? I think I need to, I, The chase, like, so when you said that I'm just going to chase less and I'm going to care less, those are the things I need to leave. I, there's this, um, Elizabeth Gilbert describes it as mysticism. And uh, I felt so deeply connected to that 
uh, like the thing that moved me to get on stage, the thing that moved me to write, it felt like for years I was moved by this larger force. Like I yes. can't even explain what that was, but it was like moving through me and I don't even take responsibility for it. But she talks about that a lot. And um, she says that, you know, we need in order to be in touch with that, which we all have and it never goes away. Cause I think that was my fear. It was like, it's going to go away. I like, I think it's already gone. And I asked her this question that I said, like, do you think like it's gone and I'm never going to get it back? And she was like, it's right there. It's right there. Just, there's a lot of noise right now, mm -hmm. but we need to figure out boundaries and priorities. And that list of priorities cannot be a long list. And so I have started the list of like things that I want I'm after tour, the things that I want to do. And there's two or three things on that list and the things that I will no longer do. Um, and that is quite a long list. And I mean, let's see, there's going to be, you know, and going on tour again is probably going to be with one of the no's and like writing another book that comes out like, every three years is probably going to be a no. Um, but I mean, I don't want to say, let me rephrase that because I don't want people to think I'm totally leaving writing. I'm not. It's the thing that is like closest to my heart. In fact, that's why I'm saying no to a majority of the things that I've been doing so that I can get back to that mystic energy, that mystic voice that's guiding all of us. I need to hear that again. Um, and it is, I don't know if you've ever experienced or kind of just like walked away from it all, but it feels exciting. And I realized that I refused to do that for so long because I was scared that all of the things I've gotten now would go away, but actually I need to walk away so I can get to the bigger place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, especially for someone that's such a, um, someone that makes life really beautiful. Um, it's like such a romantic thing. You know, you're like, I'm going to walk away and start a new thing and just completely leave it all behind. Um, but it's interesting, you know, I was thinking about when you're talking this like experience of being um, on tour and on the road and thinking about the piece you wrote about your father, you know, a lifetime on the road. And it's mm -hmm. like, how do we find ourselves subconsciously in these situations where we're just doing, you know, we're on the road, we're just like feeling like this was it like maybe it's as an immigrant it's coming to America feeling like this is it and then you're spending a lifetime just doing these things that aren't necessarily fulfilling or it were once were but then we're no longer um mm -hmm. during your journey of this path do you ever see yourself kind of caught up in maybe old mentalities that you found growing up or you've noticed with, with having immigrant parents for sure um I think that's definitely something. And I write about it in my third book a lot. I write about productivity. I perform a piece about it on the road. Uh, it took me years and lots of therapy to realize that I should take weekends off. It, like that was like, that's something that I definitely got from my parents that I didn't know was like an important mm -hmm. thing to do. Um, that and this idea of like giving 200% of yourself, you know, um, and saying yes and not having boundaries, you know, my home growing up was kind of like an open door policy, uh, whether it was refugees, undocumented folks, like we, they were in our house and, you know, mm -hmm. like my dad was always, we were always like taking people in and, um, giving and my, my mom would get sometimes so frustrated with my dad because she was like, like she's like you're taking kids out of my uh, you're taking food out of my kid's mouth and like you know giving it away because my dad was always so hard pressed on the importance of education and we have so many cousins and family back home in Punjab and you know like he was we did have less you know we didn't have the toys and the Barbies and the vacations or any of those experiences because you know once we paid the bills and you know we ate the money went back to my relatives so that he could sort of like pull people out of poverty one by one. And I think that's so beautiful. And I mm -hmm. think that's some definitely something that I want to hold on to. But I think I def 
definitely need to moving forward, figure out boundaries. And I see that with my dad, like he's learning boundaries and he's also learning areas. He says he can't, he doesn't even know how to have them. So um, those are definitely things I picked up from them that, you know, that have now like led to burnout. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also great success. You know, it's like, I think a lot of times we kind of are like, oh, this is, it's, it feels so much. You're like, I'm burning out. I'm giving too much. And then you also, it's like, this has created such a beautiful healing experience for so many. And, you know, I think us as consumers of your art and people that really relate are so grateful um, mm -hmm. for, you know, your road up in the past 10 years what would be something you would potentially do differently? Like what would be one thing that you would do? Maybe it is boundaries. Maybe it is um, more self-care. Would it be more time off? Would you have taken the time off sooner? Yeah. I mean, I wish I did take, like I've ne I haven't mm -hmm. taken any time off. Um, you know, I haven't taken any time off and I thought I was okay with that. I had so much energy and even when I was exhausted or extremely depressed, I was always tied into a contract or some other like legally binding thing that just I couldn't get out of. And yeah. one thing I, I stopped doing was signing contracts with my publishers. And it was of such a freeing, like my last book, the last book that I was contracted to write came out in 2020. And after that, I was like, no more. And I saw something so interesting happen. The moment I was no longer bound to this thing, the creativity just started to flow more and more freely. And I mean, that's how Healing Through Words happened. That that book, if I had signed another book deal, the Healing Through Words was never going to happen because I would have pushed myself to write another book of poems, having experienced nothing new because it's just been COVID, you know? Um, so that's definitely something that um, a lesson I'm taking forward is like can making sure I continue not to like bind myself to those things. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I am challenging myself to taking real time off, not a week, not three weeks, not a month, but like a longer period because one thing I've been realizing is like, it's been amazing. And I, I speak from such a place of privilege. I'm deeply privileged to take time off. Um, but I also have a responsibility to myself as a creator and to my readers to give them the most honest art possible. And what I've noticed is that all these blessings, it's been like collecting gold and I've been like just holding it and it's been surrounding me but there's a certain point where it almost seems to begin to feel like it's trapping you from the inside. Mm -hmm. And so now I think it's time to undo some of that so that I can charge right through it and make the next thing. That's huge. Yeah. I'm excited because if imagining, you know, taking a month off it's like you and your tender area era you and your soft and like slow era like that writing is just going to be mm -hmm. incredible but it's interesting how we kind of yeah it's like we create these prisons for ourselves almost where we're like I want the success and that's you know when the capitalism kind of comes into play where it's like okay we're going to create this situation where we're monetizing your soul gifts we're doing these things and you sort of feel trapped but you were talking about boundaries a little bit, you know, as something you're learning. And I think as a collective, we're all really learning and understanding boundaries. Have you had to set boundaries with friends or relationships in your life? And how has that felt? Oof, I'm so bad at boundaries. I think my <laughs> me setting boundaries with my friends wasn't even like a healthy, formal conversation. It was more so like, I'm just so <laughs> bad at being in touch with people that yes. they're like, okay, this girl's never going to pick up her phone. Um, <laughs> I, I think I've become, in terms of my relationships and friends, because they've seen me sort of like go through this journey. I, I'm very lucky to have like such a solid group of girls um, who are just there to hold me. Mm -hmm. um, I think I need to just, I need to learn to have better boundaries with myself because I, 
become so driven and so ambitious that I put myself and my life on the back burner. Nobody, you know, they're not the ones pushing me or telling me to do it or putting me in uncomfortable situations. I'm doing that. Um, and it's weird. You know what I struggle with boundaries is because I always, I feel bad and selfish. Like it just is mm -hmm. such a, it's definitely not a concept I've fully, I'm walking toward it right now, but it's not exactly a concept I've fully embraced and learned to execute yet. I know that it's important and I'm walking toward that road, but I still have a long way to go before I can really execute it in like the best way possible. Yeah, I think we're all like in the phase where it's like, we're like boundary, no. And we're kind of in the, like very abrupt, abrasive type boundary phase. And I'm like looking forward to the phase of self-worth being so high that boundaries sort of happen naturally, you know, where a boundary yeah. is sort of felt energetically and it's not needed to be said or discussed or explained because we know those people in our lives or maybe you know those people. I know people where I'm like, I can feel boundaries from mm -hmm. them, but they don't need to say anything. You know, it's a self-worth that's you. so high. You know what I mean? I'm like, those are oh, I get chills. Yes. Those wow. people are so iconic. Like, yeah. Do you can you think of a person like that that you know? Actually, now that you say it, I feel like that's kind of what me and all my friends have. That's probably why we've never mm. really had to have. I've never had to have that. Like, they know. They Love kind it. of know. They know. They know what is... I think they can definitely feel it off of me. That, And I feel it off of them. And it's probably mm -hmm. why our relationship over the last, like... I mean, my, some most of these friends I've had for over a decade is quite strong. Um, and wow, you just gave me the language for that. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank yes. You. And I'm in the new book. Um, I'm in the next one, but you talked about friendships at one of your tours in this year, and you were saying it resonated so much with your audience, you know, the concept of friendship. And, mm -hmm. um, it's something with our community. We talk about mm -hmm. quite a bit because I think female relationships or female friendships are so deep and so like, oh my God, just incredibly profound. What has yes. been your experience with female relationships? Oh my gosh. I mean, I wouldn't be here where I am today without the, re my, the relationships I have with the women in my life. Like, and I say that when I see them and I say it on the stage, those women, these women, they saw this for me way mm -hmm. like years ago like which is why they you know put me on stage and gathered around me to support so I grew up in um Brampton which is mostly like it's a working class immigrant city and uh, I was involved in a lot of community organizing around um Sikh and Punjabi issues like my community faced mm -hmm. uh experienced a genocide in 1984 and there's been lots of issues with um female infanticide, farmer suicide, a lot of issues back home. And although we live in Canada, we are deeply connected to the motherland. And so the diaspora is so connected to the issues back home. So we were always organizing around those issues as teenagers. And that's kind of where I met my crew of girls who we became artists together. Like we were all broke and we all had no money, but we all were like, I want to like perform poetry. and I want to be a filmmaker or a photographer. And you know, we'd gather equipment from our house and meet at the park and like go make things. And that was like, I was only possible because they, they gathered around me and they saw that for me. And we did that for each other. And we continue to do that for each other. And I, I always say like, the women, the relationships I have with women, like those are medicinal relationships. Like I cannot I could live without a romantic relationship, but I could not live without the women in my life. It just, it would be too isolating and it would be too lonely. And it is so, those relationships are so deep and so special because they just see you. They see the layers yes. and it's different. It's so, it's, yes, that's what I always say. I'm like, women just see you and the way that you're held 
and understood and like um my friendships now it's so important for me to have them be with me through the whole process where it's like we're not getting stuck on anger we're not getting stuck on grief we're not getting stuck on joy we're able to like oh you feel this way today great I'm with you oh you feel this way today great I'm with you it's like allowing all the emotions and allowing the transformation and allowing the growth and you know the question here is for a lot of women listening they crave those type of relationships those really intimate beautiful relationships with women what would be advice for them for cultivating those so that they can feel seen and held in the way that you do mm. I think getting involved in your local community through volunteer work um, and activism, at least for me, because that's a passion of mine, mm -hmm. I would I would personally mm -hmm. start there uh, to meet like minded individuals like you have to. And, you know, and also I've met some great friends on Twitter who then I like met up with and, you know, I'm close friends with them now, but I think stepping outside and going into your community and trying things you've never tried before. Find a book club, uh, create a book club with your friends, you know, or find a writing circle. Uh, but I think it's really important to step outside and find that close by so that we can like, you can consistently have that moment of like circling back, whether it's once a month, every two weeks, seeing each other in person, I think is like really, really important. And knowing that, you're not the only one feeling that way. Like there's that poem about friendship. I have a couple, but every time I perform it, every time I share it, it's like, it just cracks through something that I didn't even know would resonate so much. And so if it helps, like so many people are craving that. And I think, especially as adults, I felt a deep loneliness leaving college because, you know, for from the time that you're in kindergarten to the end of college, it's like you're surrounded by peers. Nobody tells you how jarring it's going to be when you graduate and you're just by yourself figuring it out on your own. And then after that, unless you're working with people who you would, you know, potentially want to be friends with, it's so difficult to meet new people and make new friends. Um, but I think and when you meet the right ones, you know, energetically, you will just hit it off and like you will make that effort and it, sometimes it's not easy and it like any relationship is work as I'm sure you know when a lot of that work is not fun um but it's important to do so that you can experience the other side of it which is fun and joyous and beautiful I'm so glad you said that because this is like my question I've been pondering myself recently is around work in relationships and finding the balance of when is the work for your spiritual growth in relationships? When is it part of the conscious relationship? And when is a relationship just unaligned? And I'm curious your thoughts on that, like how people can figure that out. Because I think in our space, when we're like, yes, relationships are hard. You have to look at your shadow. You have to look at the parts of you that are ugly. You have to really put your ego aside. You have to choose love again and again, which isn't easy. And then when is it a time where it feels like it's unaligned and there might be too much efforting? Have you ever had any of those experiences or do you have any thoughts on, on that when I say that? Hmm. Do you mean relationships with friends or anybody or like romantic I relationships? I even think what both. I think both. Okay. I think both. I don't know. I think... I kind of will always come back to I always say that I can't expect people to if I'm giving this person so much I can't give expecting that in return and if this person teaches me that mm. perhaps they can't love me or share with me the ways that I want then I need to and then that's okay. And then I know that maybe then I'm not going to pour my heart and my soul into this, you know, like, and so I kind of had to learn that throughout years. It's like, I have some friends who, 
you know, I, I'm going to party with them and like, that's kind of it. And we're going to have a great night, but they're not the folks that I'm going to call when my like heart is broken and I need somebody to like pick me up and like, just take me for ice cream. Um, but I think we always know like the gut and the instinct is always speaking to us. And sometimes we're just too afraid to listen. Um, but I think listening to your instinct is very, very important. And I think like, for me, it's always been like, I don't know if you, sometimes when something is, I, I leave when it's toxic. Yeah. That's kind of when I'm like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. But sometimes I, I have friendships that are very difficult, but I know that that's something that they are dealing with in their own life. And I bring how much I can and I support how much I can. And then that there's a boundary that I draw and then I go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dr. Tema Bryant, she came on the podcast and she said, there's such a difference between um, saying, I don't know, and saying, I know, but I'm scared. Because mm -hmm. I think that's for a lot of people, their intuition speaks to them, it's telling them something, and they know, but they're scared to say or admit it. I know I'm someone that happens to me all the time where I'm like, I don't know, I don't know. And it's I know, but I'm scared to admit it, or I'm scared to make a move or, or take a step further. Have you ever had a friendship breakup? Have you ever had your heart broken by a friend um, in your life? I have. I have. You know, I, I'm very lucky. I haven't had that for quite some time. <laughs> um, I'm very lucky for that. But I've had, like, some of my best friends, like, in high school, really. That's mm -hmm. when the last time it happened for me. Mm -hmm. um, that truly broke my heart. And I have had you know although I haven't had like toxic friendship breakups one of my my dear long, longest friend I've had since I was in sixth grade my best friend um my relationship we went from seeing each other every single day from like the start of sixth grade to college and then when all of this started happening for me and the book started coming out and my interests and my ambitions sort of began to change well not change I actually just began to step into the ambitions and step into all of that she did have um she saw it differently she saw it as like me putting our relationship second and not caring and all of those so I think that was probably in recent years the most difficult transition I've had is um we sort of stepped away from our relationship for a year and I thought it was never ever gonna like we were never gonna come back together again um and it was a relationship I never ever thought would end you know like we were like we would talk about oh one day we're gonna get married and we'll do this and we'll do that and we'll have kids and we're just gonna grow old together it's gonna be great and then boom it just disappeared and a year after you know she sort of came back and she was like I'm sorry you know, I thought you were being selfish, but you weren't being selfish. You were just aligned in your purpose. And I'm realizing that now and like, let's work on it. And, you know, our relationship, I love her so deeply. Um, and, but our relationship will never go back to how it was because I can't see her every day and I can't call her every day. And like, I still grieve that because I miss that. And she is medicine for me. Um, but I've realized friendships will work like this, you know, we'll grow together and then we'll go apart, but we can come back and there's so many ebbs and flows and it doesn't always just have to be closeness and perfect. Um, in fact, I think most of it is just kind of like this. Yeah. That's so beautiful. And yeah, the high school relationships, man, because during that those that, those years, you're just so desperately clinging to feeling less alone and feeling seen it is like such a tender. I mean, those relationships with women, some of the most heartbreak I've ever felt. It's so and you are just like so close. It is like, yeah, you're yeah. like, you're my bridesmaid. You're like 14. You're like, you're my <laughs> bridesmaid. We're together forever. <laughs> this is us. Period. The end. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the new book and healing yeah. through words, which is so beautiful. And I'm so excited about it. Um, and I was wondering, you know, even before healing through words, was there ever a time where you 
were able to go, you were kind of using bad things like numbing or social media or validation or relationships as a crutch for your healing instead of healing in the right way, which is through the writing? Uh, I've always used like writing and art as a way to heal. Um, I would say from the periods of like 2016 or 2017 up until 2020, I was extremely numb because I went through like a very a very intense period of depression so during those times I was I think I just resorted to the numbness like it was too much to handle and one thing I realized is like when you try not to feel the negative things and you numb yourself to the negative things then you also numb yourself to the joy that can possibly come in and so um it that took and during those moments like writing became very unenjoyable like it was just not fun and actually sometimes I was like triggered by it I was like oh my god like I can't even I can't even think about doing that right now um but now as I'm I, I challenge myself every single day when I sit down I'm like no you are writing today is for you do not think about who's going to read it. Do not think about, oh my God, what the final outcome or what the product is going to be. And um, that's healing through words feels, and that's kind of why I wrote healing through words is because writing became so difficult once I became so well known for the writing, it became so hard to do. And I lost that relationship with it. And I searched for tools and I searched for resources to help me fall back into that place where the writing was effortless and I didn't find those the resources I was looking for. And so I began to create these writing exercises to help me drop into the writing. And then COVID hit. And then I began to do Instagram live writing workshops with my community. And I was surprised to find that so many of my readers are actually writers. Like sometimes we would have like 10,000 people on an IG live writing for over an hour and then healing through words kind of went from being something I was writing to uh, something I was creating to help me write to something I was creating as like a gift to them as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's 60 over 65 writing exercises along with like tips and tricks and secrets that I use to edit and like figure out what I want to write about. Um, and I wrote it, to help me write my next book. Like that's kind of like, I, I go, I use it when I'm like free writing or when I don't know what to write about. And I'm hoping that it's going to create, help me create my next body of work. And I'm excited to see what my readers create with it. Mm -hmm. What if someone's listening and they're like, I'm not a writer. I don't write, you know, like what would be your message to someone that's like, I'm, but I'm not a writer. This book is not for writers. And I was very conscious of the first page it says, uh, I talk about creativity. I talk about who gets to be creative. And I say, want to know what makes me sad when someone tells me they're not creative. Mm -hmm. And we have somehow convinced millions of people that you can be creative or you can be logical, but you can't be both things as if creativity is this skill that's only accessible to a select few when I, I actually believe that creativity is innate to all of us as humans who are living and breathing. And so what I've done with these exercises is I have created them in a way where if you've never written a day in your life, you will be able to do them. Um, and it's for, and for those folks, you know, it's a great book to, use as a part of your self-care. That's really what I wanted it to be, a moment of thoughtfulness, a moment of healing, a moment of really inner listening. Um, as I, you know, step forward trying to cancel and shut out the noise in my life and step into listening and hearing myself, I hope that other people find that it can help them do that and they can sort of add it to their daily self-care practice. Mm. Yeah, it's the writing process and the creativity process. It's like that. It's like the soul, you know, it's it's really it's that unique essence that is us. 
I was with our dear friend, Letitia, and her sister is a health coach, and she is someone that was raving about seed. I am in so many conversations with people, and they talk about products they love, especially living in Los Angeles, doing what we do. She is absolutely obsessed with seed, and she showed me pictures of her skin before she started taking seed and after, and it was so wild. So I was so encouraged to know someone that is in the health and wellness space as a coach yeah. really loves seed too. Yeah. So if you're not familiar, this is a broad spectrum two-in-one probiotic and prebiotic. Um, it has 24 distinct probiotic strains and seed is like known for the science behind it. So you can go to their website and I actually love just kind of perusing and learning more about the why behind their product and how it works. Um, it's a two-in-one capsule. The capsule itself makes sure that the probiotic and prebiotic are delivered to the colon. If you've ever taken a probiotic before and never felt the difference, it's likely because mm -hmm. the good bacteria wasn't surviving your GI tract. So this is really, really unique about seed. It's designed differently. That's why it works. Um, and we've just heard so many people, not only us, that have had incredible benefits from taking seed on the daily my skin for sure. Um, and I've just noticed like my energy levels mm -hmm. as well. I think our gut microbiome is the key to optimizing our health on so many levels. Yeah. I've noticed such a better difference in my digestion. I feel more regular. I feel like it supports this difference in my body that eases bloating and it just has mm -hmm. been great. So if you want to start a new healthy habit today, visit seed.com slash almost 30 and use the code almost 30 to redeem 20% off your first month of Seed's DS01 Daily Symbiotic. That's seed.com slash almost 30 and use the code almost 30 at checkout for 20% off your first month. A trend that I've noticed with a lot of our guests is that their life transformed when they started going to therapy. We had a really powerful guest on today who was talking about all the changes they've made in their life after going to therapy. And I am a therapy lover and it has really changed me. So I know how powerful it can be. It's wild. Like during the week, you know, I'll go through, I'll have like ups and downs, whatever. And it's just knowing that I have that appointment set. I go every two weeks that gives me that peace of mind knowing that I'm going to have the space to talk, to process, to kind of look at things from a different perspective. Um, and then also after therapy, you kind of go into the next week with like, okay, here's this new awareness. I can catch myself. I can catch those thoughts. So it's just like this beautiful commitment and uh, cycle of sorts that I found myself in that's been really healthy for my mental health and emotional health. And if you're thinking about therapy, Maybe this is your sign to explore. And I know a lot of the sticking points can be, well, I don't have time mm -hmm. or it's, you know, too expensive, expensive or um, not as accessible, but BetterHelp makes it accessible. So this is therapy that you can do online. They will connect you with a licensed therapist. Um, you answer some questions about, you know, your goals and uh, just where you're at really. And say you're matched with a therapist and you're like, hmm, this isn't the right fit. They make it super easy to change your therapy. Therapist. Again, it's convenient, accessible, affordable. It's more affordable than traditional therapy and it's entirely done online. So you ready? I'm ready. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. If you are looking to find a therapist, betterhelp.com slash almost 30 will get you 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash almost 30. You'll get 10% off your first month. In A Course in Miracles, I really love um, where they talk about creativity and they talk about creation as if it's adding to what already is perfect. And it's mm. this unique creation where you're just adding a little bit more flavor and color to an already perfect and beautiful life or, you know, if you perceive it to be that way. But I remember for most of my life, I was like, oh, I'm just business. I'm whatever. And finding out that I was creative and that was mm -hmm. such a special part of me is such an act of self-care and self-love. So I'm so excited for people to pick up the book and write. It'd be powerful for people to do book clubs like around the mm -hmm. world where they could come together almost as accountability and do some of the exercises together and maybe even read their work together because there's such a healing in, in having it be shared, not for you know, not for their response, but just for like the beauty of the uniqueness of each person's creativity. 
Absolutely. I think that's what really excites me too, is like Mm -hmm. all of us, everybody who goes through this book, we're all given the same exercises. It's all the same prompts, but each of us is going to walk away with something so unique and so different. And writing is one of those crafts that I think is innate to all of us. And so many of us, I personally use it as a way to process. And it's one of those crafts where I think as living, breathing humans, it just makes sense, whether you pursue it professionally or not. Um, And I have been thinking about sort of like, what do I want to do? And like, do I want to set something like a book club up, book club up? But then I'm like, okay, I'm also saying boundaries. Like maybe I can let my readers... Let them figure it out. Hundred <laughs> percent story of my life. I like do that with all my friends. And I'm like, okay, I've got a business idea. They're like, I'm overwhelmed. I'm like, I've got something for you. Book clubs everywhere, leading them. Like, we're gonna make it massive. It's like just let the work. Let people do what they want with their work, and let people like exist how they want. Um, okay, last question from me. This has been such a delight. I'm. I was so honored and grateful that you were able to come on. We are such huge fans of you. Um, our community is such huge fans of you. So this has just been even better than what I could have imagined. You are such a pure heart. And and it's interesting, you know, just you're like, oh, I'm not living in integrity. I'm like, oh, I feel like your soul and your the way you exude is just so an integrity to what I perceive. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just wanted to reflect that back. Thank but, you. I appreciate um, it. So you're about to turn 30. If you were 60 and you were listening to this podcast episode, what would be the one message or what would be the way you'd like to be living your life in the next 30 years? If you were 60 and you're like, I'm so glad that I'm living off the grid. I'm in a relationship with someone I love. Like what would be the dream vision for your life? I just want, I want to be 60 and know that I have like laughed as much as I possibly could have. And that's yeah. it. <laughs> oh my God. Say no more. Thank you for the, the literally perfect answer. <sighs> Uh, talking to you has been so nice I mean even when I listen to all to the episodes like I don't know if it's like the sound it is what you say but like your voice it just it feels so safe and so calming um thank you for allowing me to show up as my imperfect self because that's what I feel today I feel imperfect and um thank you for all thank you for the pep talk I'm excited to turn 30 I'm excited to I can't wait. You are going to have your greatest era and you are going to be not giving a fuck, laughing your ass off, looking better than ever, creating soft, her soft era work. It is going to be, I can't freaking wait. You're going to be the best. So I'm hopeful. I want to try and find you on tour so I can just even give you even more love, but our audience is going to be so excited for the book healing through words, which is out September 27th. Um, And you you guys already know and follow her and love her. So thank you for such a delightful afternoon. I'm so grateful. Thank you. I'm so grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rupi, for joining us. Again, she is on tour. Her new book is out now. Be sure to grab it. Just thank you for sitting down with us. We know you're so, so busy. Yeah, we appreciate it. Her new book is out now. It's Healing Through Words. And thank you to our sponsors for this episode. You can find all discounts in our show notes as well as on almost30.com. We appreciate your listenership. You guys are the best. We have episodes twice a week. And we also have a new podcast, Morning Microdose. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review. Give it a listen. And we will see you soon. We'll see you soon. We love you guys. Bye. Bye.